Christian Parenting. Welcome to the Bible for Kids podcast with your host, best-selling children's author, Amy Parker, and author and co-creator of VeggieTales, Mike Naraki. If instilling biblical values in kids is important to you, this podcast will give you the resources, wisdom, and hope to do just that. Now, let's join our hosts, Amy and Mike, for this week's episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Bible for Kids podcast. I'm Mike Naraki. And I'm Amy Parker, and today we're speaking with husband, wife, and co-authors, Jimmy and Kristen Scroggins. We're going to talk all about how to have crucial conversations with your kids, so buckle up, and their book, Full Circle Parenting. But first, we like to start every episode of the Bible for Kids podcast with a Bible verse. Mike? These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road when you lie down, and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. And that's from Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9 in the Christian Standard Bible. So Jimmy and Kristen Scroggins have been married for 26 years and have eight children, James, Daniel, Jeremiah, Isaac, Stephen, Anna Kate, Mary Claire, and Caleb. They have served at Family Church since Jimmy became the lead pastor in July 2008. Under Jimmy's leadership, Family Church has grown to a network of neighborhood churches in South Florida. The Scroggins family is passionate about Family Church's mission to build families by helping them discover and pursue God's design. Jimmy and Kristen, welcome to the Bible for Kids. Oh man, we're so glad to be with you guys. Thanks for having us. Oh, it's great to have you. And I I had the pleasure of meeting three of your kids right before we started recording. I said hi to him as Larry. So uh, that was great. great. They were starstruck. You've been in our living room for years and years every day. So Uh, they felt honored. What an impact they've made on our family. You talk about teaching kids the Bible. I I just can't uh, express our gratefulness. Yeah. Oh yeah. my goodness. Well, thank you all. And it was, it was so nice to meet them and see their smiles. I think the, the three that I met were like 13 and 12 in that range. Yes. Right. Yes. Can, can you talk a little about, about your kids in general? Like, you know, we, there's eight, so that's amazing. Um, and what, what is their age range and, um, and bonus points, if you can name all of them. Okay. <laughs> we have, um, we have six sons and two daughters and uh-huh. the age range of them all are 25 all the way down to 12. So we have two married sons Uh and uh, they have given us our first two grandchildren. Actually, we had a You totally do not look like grandparents. I I just love it when people say that. That Bring it on. (laughs) We had our first grandson was born in November and our first granddaughter was born in January. So we have um, married children. We have college children students. We have high school students, middle schoolers, and our caboose just finished the first grade today. Wow. So, fifth, fifth, grade. fifth grade. Fifth grade. <laughs> fifth grade. <wow. laughs> yeah. Our 12 year old is a little slow. <laughs> no, no, no. Fifth grade. Fifth grade. All right. <laughs> oh, well, that is, that is so awesome. And, and as with, with, with eight kids that after a while, does that tend to be like a, um, uh, like a self-sustaining group, like the, the like with the older ones who were taking care of the younger ones as they were growing up is how, how does that, how did that, how did that work as they were, as they were getting older and, and kids caring for, for the younger, their younger siblings? Yeah, I think that that totally happens to a degree of probably any family, no matter how many kids you have, but Kristen does a really good job of putting those kids to work and teaching them how to take responsibility for themselves. Yeah. And uh, so that has been, and one of the things that Kristen's done a great job too is is really helping our kids love one another and pull for one another. And so yeah. we call it uh, Team Scroggins. And Aww. if you uh, came over, you, you'd feel it. Yeah, I love that. That's I love awesome. That. That's so, so cool. And you have jerseys, I'm sure, right? <laughs> well, we do have a lot of jerseys, that's right. <laughs> so you're in the midst of eight or so different stages of parenting and two of those have made it all the way to being parents themselves. Mm -hmm. So you've seen some things. (laughs) Um, No doubt. Yeah. (laughs) So what is, if you could just boil it down to one takeaway, what is the biggest takeaway that you've learned so far? Well, we've been saying that uh, good theology leads to good parenting strategies that Mm. creates good parenting conversations. And I think if there's yeah. one thing that we we have learned to, to boil it down is that 
you know, the Bible gives us God's design for all sorts of things, including our parenting and our family relationships. And if we'll, we'll start there, then we can have some good uh, applied strategies as parents, some things we can try to actually do. And that creates all kinds of really uh, meaningful parenting conversations. You actually talked about it in the verse that you opened this podcast right. up with when you, uh, you, you know, you said from Deuteronomy chapter six, six through nine, that we're supposed to teach our kids in the way when they wake up in the morning, when they lay down at night, God, God never gives us a, a, a second where we're not supposed to be talking about him. But the verse before that six, five really is the challenge that, that we as parents have to take up first. And that's love the Lord, your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mm. and then teach those yeah. to our children. And I think that's the key of our theology has to be right. We have to know what God tells us about him and the world and ourselves so that we can have this strategy that makes sense in relation to his design. And so those conversations are always guided by that truth. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. And, and in your book, um, full circle parenting, um, uh, as you were as you were conceiving it, who did you write this book for, and and what what inspired it? What were sort of the early seeds of the idea of the book? Well, I, th I think uh, a couple of things happened. One, our our children started getting married and having children of their own, and so you know it's really not cool to give a lot of advice to your adult children. So we so, <laughs> so we, I'm learning. We, you know, we really I'm learning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My my children are 23 and 20 now, and I'm just starting to find that out. <laughs> yeah, right. So we wrote them a book. So we don't, we'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll tell them that the book was for them. Uh, but then also, you know, we have a we have a relatively large church with a lot of young uh, pastors, and they're, they're they're starting their families and getting married and having kids. And we kind of just wrote the book. We went right to our own children to the to the team that we serve with in South Florida every day. And then amazingly, uh, B and H, uh, Broadman Home and Publishers, they decided to publish it, and other people can read it too. So that's uh, that's kind of where it came from. That's awesome. That's awesome. And then, yeah. So, so to help out parents in, in various stages of of parenting as well as you've stepped through. Yeah. Yeah. There's no question. And, and you know, these conversations, parenting conversations, are so important because they don't start when your kids like go through puberty or go away to college. You start having parenting conversations with the day they're born. Right. And so what do we talk about and how do we create those conversations and set them up in the right way? And how do we respond to conversations that kind of erupt in the day to day? Yeah. Yeah. And so you talk a little bit about that, um, the three circles, and it's not just about conversation. So just tell us the basis. What, it, what are the three circles and um, where did you come up with that idea? Well, uh, Chris and I, came up with the three circles when we were uh, talking to some, some couples that were thinking about getting married. And they came to a little class that we taught. It was called a uh, preparation for marriage. And so they showed up and when they, when they, when they came to the class, uh, we figured out that all of these people at the class, they were not who we were expecting. We we're expecting people that are like 20, 21, 22, maybe about to graduate from college, Christian kids who just wanted to benefit from all of our you know, wisdom. Cause by then we've been married like 10 years and we knew everything. So we, we want to <laughs> yeah, share 10 years them. is that magical number for no, we knew everything. <laughs> and so uh, we found out though, when the people came to the class, all the people in the class were thirties uh, and forties, all of them were living together. None of them were married. Uh, very few of them were church goers at all. They didn't know any Bible verses or any Bible stories. And they were thinking about getting married. So we said, okay, we've got to find a way to talk to them about family life and talk to them about God's design. And we got to talk to them in a way that people can grasp who don't know a lot of Bible verses or Bible stories. Yeah. So we came with a diagram, three circles, this idea that God has a design. And then we depart from God's design because we sin against God. We go our own way, take shortcuts or whatever. When we do that, the result is we end up in brokenness. That's the second circle. And when we're in brokenness, we know something needs to change. And, uh, but the kind of change we need doesn't come from in here. The kind of change we need has to come from somewhere else. And that's the third circle, which is the gospel. And yeah. that's Jesus crucified on the cross for our sins and raised from the dead. Yeah. And then God invites us to trust him, to believe in him. And if we'll do that, he'll forgive us from our sins. He'll begin to heal the broken places in our lives. And he will help us recover and pursue his design. So it, it's a gospel tool, you know, teaching people how, how they can come to know Christ as Savior and yet as parents, we also realize that the gospel 
informs everything that we do. And so we, we, we want to make sure that we are constantly putting God's design before our, our children. And yet we also have to make sure that we're always putting forth his redemptive plan as well, mm-hmm. because there's just going to be some times when our kids know the right thing to do and they don't do it. You know, the apostle Paul gives us good company in that, right? And mm-hmm. Romans seven, he says, the things I know I shouldn't do, I do those anyway. And the things I, I you know, I shouldn't, I should do, I don't do those. And, and our kids are going to experience that. And so is, are their moms and dads. And so right. we have to know God's design and yet always keep that redemptive aspect of the gospel before them. Mm. That is well, so good. And I want to hear about what the couples, uh, how the couples responded to that. But we have to take a really quick break and we will be right back on the Bible for Kids podcast. Kids have a lot of questions about God, faith, and the Bible. Why did Jesus come to earth? Who wrote the Bible? What is faith? If you're looking for a great resource to answer some of kids' toughest questions, check out The Big Book of Bible Questions by best-selling author Amy Parker and apologist Doug Powell. With sound theology and kid-friendly terms, Amy and Doug tackle 60 questions covering the Old and New Testaments. The vibrant, playful pictures bring each answer to life and make this book even more fun for kids to read on their own. Plus, you'll love having this book at your fingertips during your family devotions or for those moments when you might need some help with answering your child's questions. The Big Book of Bible Questions is available now from your favorite bookseller. One boy plus two rehydrated squirrels equals hilarious adventures in the Dead Sea Squirrels books written by Mike Naraki. Ten-year-old Michael Gomez finds two petrified squirrels while exploring a cave in Israel and stows them into his backpack, the perfect souvenirs from his trip, or so he thought. When the squirrels get rehydrated during a rainstorm, Michael comes face to face with the rather chatty couple, Merle and Pearl Squirrel, who witnessed Jesus' teachings 2,000 years ago. Hilarious missteps and misadventures happen throughout the series as Michael and his friends navigate life while Merle and Pearl offer wisdom along the way in their own squirrel style. The first six books in the Dead Sea Squirrels series are available at your favorite bookseller, and be sure to look for the Dead Sea Squirrels three-book starter pack, which makes a great gift for kids who love to laugh and read at the same time. Welcome back to the Bible for Kids podcast, and Amy and I are speaking with Jimmy and Kristen Scroggins. So I want to know, like, you have these um, couples in your class, and they're not really, you know... They don't ha- have that foundation of faith. And then that's, they come to a marriage class and then you give them a, um, a religion or faith or gospel class. How did they respond to that? And how did you see their approach toward marriage change as a result? Well, you know, what was great about that group? It was a small group. And so we were really able eight to, couples, right, yeah. eight couples. We were really able to get in deep and several of those couples Uh, came to know the Lord through that class. And so that was such a blessing because what a great way to start off your marriage, you know, both of you coming to know the Lord. And then there were some that did know the Lord, maybe one or the other, but um, they came to know Christ. They decided to build their marriage on, on his foundations. And so we felt honored to be a part of that with them. Yeah, it was really kind of a fun thing. And we did a lot of their wedding. So uh, we, you know, and and in (laughs) South Florida, it's so fun because it's so diverse. So like, I did my first uh, uh, Jamaican Puerto Rican wedding, you know, in the backyard of this couple. And it was oh, the food there must have been amazing. It was the yeah. food was amazing, but it wasn't really Baptist, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but it was still awesome. We had a great time. We did. That's awesome. Well, and you know, we were talking about the three circles, and it seems like you know, in terms of having the tough conversations with our kids, those three circles are really important. Can you kind of maybe give us some examples of, of, of that? Right. So, you know, man, let's just take, can we take like marriage, sexuality, and gender maybe as a, as a way to talk about through the three circles. So there's so much in our society now revolving around that specific subject. And sometimes as parents, we don't know what to do because everything's changing constantly. And that's why what we said earlier about having a good theology is so important because we can't possibly keep up with every variation or every change that the world is throwing at us or our children, but we can know what God's design is for our kids. And so as we have these conversations in relation to marriage, dating, sexuality, gender, 
we have this grid to go by that God so graciously gives us in his word. And so our conversations have to be filtered through his plan for our kids. And then, you know, we, we just have to be really clear when, when sin arrives on the scene, whether it's our children personally or things that they have experienced that were beyond their control, or maybe just things that they've seen that they're trying to process. And yet then, even though, you know, sinfulness is a part of all of this, apart from God's design, he always gives us a way forward if we'll come back to him. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, talking about his goodness and his, his, ability for us to repent and for his steadfast love to, to wash over us and, and, and make us be able to get back on track from where we are with God's design is really important. Mm. Yeah. And I can see how that could be just transformative in, in, in the conversations that, that you have with your kids. So tell us if you would, mm -hmm. some of the tough conversations you've had with your own children through the years and, and how this method looks when you're using it, you know, for, for practical purposes, how this looks in real life. Well, we can follow up on all sorts of things. What, what I'll just kind of follow up on the track that Christian was on. So if you raise, you know, you're raising a bunch of teenagers while well, they all have devices, they'll have access to technology and managing technology is a gigantic yes. issue. Please Whether you're a Christian or not, how to fix it. <laughs> uh, so, so that's the only thing about the book. I'm going to want to disappoint you, but like, we are, this is not one of those books where you read it and you go, Oh my gosh, now I know exactly how to have perfect kids. Cause we have no idea how to do that. This is more like, Hey, here's how to respond when everything goes to hell in a handbasket, which, which I think people would identify with a whole lot more. All right. So when it comes to managing technology, if you find out one of your kids has been looking at things on YouTube or on the internet or on social media, that is in a, that, that are, that's inappropriate for them to see. Um, or maybe they, they've even developed some, some sinful habits in regards to these things. Um, what are you going to do when you figure that out? And I don't think there's any parent in America who's going to say, oh, no, that's never happened to my kids. Mm -hmm. My kids would never do that. So every parent that I know has had these conversations. Of course, we don't want to have them in front of church people because they might judge us. But, <laughs> but what we find out when we actually broach the subject is, wow, all the church people are having the same conversation with their kids that we are with ours. Yeah. It's very challenging. So what are you going to do? Well, you can't go into the field position. You, you can't shut down. You can't. You, well, <laughs> you shouldn't. That's, a, that's the title of Amy's new book. <laughs> the, fetal, the, the parental you fetal position. Find me in the fetal position. <laughs> <laughs> well, we shouldn't go in the fetal position. So we say that in order to be uh, parents, we've got to have a great poker face. So when you <laughs> find out these things, we shouldn't be shocked because we have good theology. We're not blown off of our pins that our kids have done something sinful or been exposed to something sinful because we understand that we live in a fallen world and that even our children, like we do have a sin nature. And so we're not amazed or dismayed or completely devastated when we find out that our kids are exactly what the Bible says they are. Yeah. Chris and I like to say, uh, when we got married, I was a man sinner who got connected with a woman center and then we made a bunch of little centers and, <laughs> and now we've just been sitting all over each other for the last 27 years. That's probably a more realistic view than look at this perfect angel that will never do any wrong. Um, so, Well, maybe you guys have those at your house. And if you do, no. please write us the book. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, well, and, and this, you know, we, we, we've really touched on this, but it was one of my next questions just in terms of, you know, how has this biblical approach to parenting changed your life and your children's lives? You know, they're, they're, you know, I, I, I suppose by point of comparison, you know, they're, you, you, your life is your life. So you may not have any other thing to compare it to, but um, yeah. What is your, uh, what have been some of the fruits of that? Well, I'll tell you, I have two things that just pop into my mind right away. One is that knowing these things about our children, knowing that they are going to love God and yet struggle at the same time really helps me as a mom to just stay in the game with mm -hmm. my kids, no matter what, because right. really that's what God does with his people. You know, you look yeah. all throughout the Bible of some pretty catastrophic events that his children fell into or chose 
And yet he just kept staying in the game with his people. He did not give up on his plan and his mission. And that's my job as a mom. That's Jimmy's job as a dad Mm -hmm. to walk that line with our kids and let them know there's nothing that they can do. That's going to separate them from the love of God, but from the love of mom and dad either. Yeah. But one of the things that really has been transformative in our parenting, and I think we've already seen the fruit of this in our kids, is that just realizing that our children are so complex and understanding complexity makes such a difference. And what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes we think our children are a certain way. We we are so proud. For example, we have a, a daughter who has allowed us to share this story. But she, she just from a young age, you could just tell she loved the Lord so much, had a missionary heart, wanted to see people come to know the Lord. And we were so proud of that, just prayed without being taught to. She just intuitively knew spiritual things. And yet we found out that she was also a complete chronic liar. (laughs) And she would lie about things that didn't even matter to the point where we had to go take her to apologize to people that she had really hurt. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got to tell you the truth. Uh, my sinfulness reared its head because I was responded with such embarrassment Mm. and shame and really questioned, like, does she even know the Lord? Like maybe she's just a complete fake. How could she be praying and be a missionary and love the Lord and then be lying about the craziest things. And I was so convicted in that moment as I was talking to Jimmy about, you know, my trip to the apology, you know, we were in the middle of a grocery store. Yeah. It was so embarrassing, but (laughs) I was so convicted because who do I think that I am and how many times do I do the same thing? And I allowed the setting sins in my life to rear up. And I realized she's not one or the other. She's not this awesome kid or the dregs of society. She, she is a, a, a person who has put her faith in Christ and has his handprint on her And we see those things. And yet she also has sin in her life. And so understanding that complexity helps us not to throw out the good that we see God doing in them, even when we see sin. And so why do you think it's important for our kids to see us living out the gospel in the home and outside of the church walls? I think that's, um, I think that what you just said relates to this, but, but talk about the impact that that has on our kids. Well, I think, I think uh, that's part of our task as parents is we sort of give kids their first glimpse of what God is like. And when things are working well, mom and dad are showing the kids what it looks like when people know how to forgive, when they love, uh, when, they, when they care, um, when they never give up. And if they see mom and dad loving and forgiving and caring and never giving up, it makes it easier for them to believe that God loves and cares and never gives up. And so uh, the way that we uh, respond to life and the way that we treat one another and the way that we relate to them gives them a picture of what God can be like. And when we, when we don't love and we don't care and we don't forgive, we make it harder for them to believe that yeah. God loves and cares and forgives. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's important too, that they see us mess up and, um, and how we, <laughs> it's hard though, but how we react when we mess up, you know, um, and do we, you know, do we accept God's grace in that and, um, and admit our mistakes and then just go forward, you know, and I think by modeling that we, we give them that example of, you know, just that very simple example of, of how to do that. And, um, yeah. you know, confidence that, that there is grace that, um, that we're forgiven. Parents have to be great repenters, don't we? Yeah, yeah. we do. Yeah. yeah but yeah. it's such I, a great, I mean, I think it's set up that way for a reason. It teaches our kids to be great repenters too. And isn't that, isn't that what God wants? Yeah. Amen. So if, you, if, you, if you're setting up that wall of, okay, I'm the perfect parent that doesn't do anything <laughs> wrong. I mean, there's just that, there's, the, you know, the, there's the authenticity of, of, you know, admitting that there's a mistake. And then that, that can bring us closer to our kids as well to know, okay, yeah, my parents mess up too. And, and they're forgiven. And, and so I can be too. Yeah. yeah. So. It would be pretty dumb not to admit that because your kids are, you know, we say that our kids are like hypocrisy detectives. <laughs> right. so, they so. will find you out. <laughs> they will find it. It's yeah. not like they haven't figured it out. It. <laughs> it's right. Exactly. <laughs> So, well, we've touched on, we, we've touched on this just, you know, how, in, in terms of uh, what, what drove you and inspired you to write the book, but practically speaking, how can this book help our listeners have that crucial conversation that they've been afraid to have with their kids? 
Well, hopefully what we did, we divided it. We talk about complexity, as Kristen just talked about. They got a, that's a big part of the beginning of the book. We talked about another concept we call management, which mm-hmm. I think kind of sets a good uh, tone for how parents can interact with their children. But then we divide the book up into chapters. And we talked about uh, marriage, sexuality, and gender. We talked about substance abuse and alcohol. We talked about how to have the right kind of friends and how to deal with mean kids, because everybody has to do that. Yeah. Um, we talked about uh, bitterness and forgiveness. And one more thing is, huh? I don't know. We talked, but anyway, we divide up into chapters. And so parents could like open the book up and turn to the chapter that, oh, managing technology, mm-hmm. turn to the yeah. other chapter that m- makes the most sense to them. And uh, what we try to do is give them, so they might, parents might be thinking like, how do I even talk to my kids about God's design for technology? Mm-hmm. And we give them some talking points from the Bible. Mm-hmm. Hey, here's how you could think about this. We give them some sample conversations. Maybe you could have a conversation like this. And the, we've we've had enough conversations ourselves and interacted with thousands and thousands of parents, and they've related these stories to us. So I think when you read the book, a lot of parents would go, oh, my gosh, I've had, a, I've had conversations exactly like that, or that's exactly the kind of conversation I need to have with my, with my child. Yeah. I love yeah. It. Thanks for breaking it down and just spelling it out for us because you know that's that is really what we need. <laughs> <laughs> well, we um, can all use more of that for sure. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so thank you so much, Jimmy and Kristen, for being here with us today. Tell our listeners how they can connect with you, how they can find this book, um, Full Circle Parenting. Well, you can buy Full Circle Parenting anywhere that you buy books on Amazon or anywhere else. You can go to lifeway.com's. Uh, page and they'll sell it to you there. Sometimes the price is a little better. And there's a there's a there's a website fullcircleparentingbook.com. And then if you want to hear more about our church or whatever, we're at gofamilychurch.org. Um, Kristen has a great podcast called The Mom Village, which is a uh, three multicultural moms talking about mom stuff. And uh, those are the best ways for you to find us. You can certainly follow us on Twitter at Jimmy Scroggins or yours is at I don't know. I can't even spell <laughs> Follow me and figure it out. And we have a Facebook page, Jimmy and Kristen Scroggins. So anywhere you want to follow us, we'd love to connect with you. Awesome. Thank that, you. That is great. Well, Jimmy and Kristen, thank you so much for being here once again. And listeners, we're always giving away free stuff on our socials. So go follow us on Instagram or Facebook at The Bible for Kids or on our website, thebibleforkids.com. We'll see you all next time. Bye, guys. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Bible for Kids podcast with Amy Parker and Mike Naraki. Be sure to connect with the Bible for Kids on Instagram, Facebook, and at thebibleforkids.com. The Bible for Kids podcast is powered by the Christian Parenting Podcast Network. Find out more at christianparenting.org. Our show is also available on waynation.com. Christian Parenting. 